you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 1. Let's go there. Luke chapter 1. Um, we're going to be talking about godly parents this morning. Ooh, what is a godly parent? What does that look like? Do they even exist? Um, it's certainly, you're not looking at one here, okay? Oh, uh, if we're meaning perfect, then no, it ain't me, okay? Um, and actually, I guess I'm not a parent anymore because my kids are gone. They're grown up, they've moved out, and they're hopefully busy giving me more grandkids because you can never have enough of those. And uh, so uh, let's go ahead and look at the fact that, you know, every generation today needs examples of godly parents. We're going to talk about what a godly parent is, but we need examples of those. Every generation does. When, when I think back to when, when my parents got saved in their mid-20s, okay, they already had three children. And uh, I was the youngest one. Actually, when they had me, I was the first boy. So I got two older sisters, and then they had me, and they said, wow, boys are great. And they just had three more boys after that. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. That's what I like to tell myself anyway. They were young, young, uh, young adults when they came to Christ, and their parents didn't come to Christ until just about the time they, they came to the end of their lives when there were some professions of faith being made. So my, my parents, they had no examples, okay, none. And, and then my wife and I met, we got married, and we started having children as, as young adults. And, okay, I had an example. Um, my dad did the best he could. I did the best I could, but I still needed help. We all need good examples. The parents of John the Baptist, this is who we're looking at today. They were godly, dynamic examples of what parents should be, okay? They weren't perfect, and we're going to see that. But they, uh, and they, they, they had their weaknesses, but they were examples to follow. Luke chapter 1, look with me at verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest, <coughs> excuse me, named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth, and they were both righteous before God. Wouldn't you like that to be said about you? They were righteous before God, Keep, are walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord. They were blameless when it came to that. Now, John the Baptist's parents, dad was a priest. His mom was the daughter of a priest. So you got a preacher and a preacher's kid. Okay. Wow. They're like the dynamic duo, right? Uh, we could never, whoa, let's first of all, never say never. Because God specializes in taking broken, messed up, dirty, rotten, nasty, ruined lives and making something beautiful out of them. Amen? Verse 6 says that these parents, they were both righteous before God. Okay, so they were righteous. Righteous before God. The two of them, together, as husband and wife, committed to each other and committed to God. They both came before God, seeking him, seeking to please him. In other words, let's, let's back that up. They had an internal desire to please God. And I emphasize that because I don't believe that everybody has that internal desire to please God. Many people, they, they say the right things, do the right things, look the right way, okay, show up in church, hold down their pew, and, and look the part, but they have no desire, internal desire, to please God. They, the, the, the verses we read said they walked in the commandments. They were blameless. No, it doesn't mean they were perfect. It means, it means they were faithful, do you remember the definition of a righteous man that we find in Proverbs? Proverbs 24, 16 says, a righteous man falls, but he's faithful to get back up. And that's what's going on here. They were blameless. They weren't perfect, but they were faithful. Did they have bad days? Yes. Did they fail? 
Yes, okay. Did they have days when, when the other person wondered like, ooh, who are you and what did you do with my spouse? <laughs> I'm sure they did, okay. Uh, but overall, they were faithful in adhering to God's word. They had the desire to please him. Number two, a family with problems. Uh-oh, here's this, this on the outside, perhaps perfect couple, okay? You got a preacher, you got the preacher's wife who grew up in a preacher's home. They're both preacher's kids. Um, and everything just probably looks rosy on the outside. But look at verse seven, they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren and they both were now well stricken in years. They had problems. Folks, please keep this in mind. When you see other people here at church and you think they just have the perfect little life and everything always goes well for them, you don't know what's going on behind closed doors. You don't know the grief or the anguish, the anxieties, the issues that they're dealing with. And when you see, I'll just throw this out there because, you know, I like to do this. When you see that perfect profile on Facebook and, oh, they're just so wonderful, they're not being completely honest with you, okay? Not very many people put up their garbage on Facebook. So just don't, don't believe the lie that, oh, they have it easy and I have it so bad. No, we're all in life together, okay? We all go through it. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Even John the Baptist's parents. We, we don't want to have the idea that because John the Baptist, uh, his parents, because they grew up in, oh, I guess we might call it a pastor, uh, a Christian home, um, that there's some special people. They're not. Um, I, I knew someone one time. Um, he had a couple of kids. And, and uh, he was like the perfect dad. And, and uh, the perfect home, everything just was perfect and his kids still made wrong choices in fact you know this person his name is god okay we want to be careful when we look at the outside and think we see perfection being righteous did not free zecharias and elizabeth from problems that's something else to keep in mind because many times we can be striving to do what's right and obey God's commandments and desire to know God and please God. And then bad things happen and some people get derailed when that takes place. Why is this happening to me? <laughs> I should be getting blessed right now. They had to face life just like everybody else does. In Matthew 5, 45, it says, For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good. He sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. That's, that's the verse behind my paraphrase. Life happens to everybody, okay? The good, the bad, and the ugly. It happens to all of us. These parents, this couple, they were childless. Now, we have to understand something, okay? Those of you that you're maybe going through a stage of parenting right now where you think, oh, that sounds wonderful right about now, okay? Um, in this society, a child, uh, it wasn't just something they wanted. Culturally, it was something that showed you were blessed by God. So not having children in their culture meant there's something wrong with you. Uh, spiritually speaking, that, that God wasn't smiling on you for some reason. It was just a cultural thing, all right? Um, it was a, a life problem that weighed heavily on them. And to compound that, they were elderly. The Bible says, well, stricken in years. Perhaps um, only those people that are elderly, however you define that, whatever age that is, perhaps only those can fully understand the depth of that statement. There, there are problems that come with getting older. Am I right? Yes. <laughs> so here's Zacharias and Elizabeth. 
they're doing the commandments, they're obeying, they're righteous before God, a good Christian couple, we might say, and life was happening to them, just like everybody else. But there was a difference. They, it says, were righteous before God. Okay, how does that make a difference? The difference is this. They had the presence of God to help them through those problems. What we go through, other people go through. If, if we focus on living righteous before God, God doesn't say, you're not going to have any problems. But he does say, I'm going to be with you in those problems. His presence is there. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Simply put, that means what you're experiencing, other people are too. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Let's move on to a third aspect here, a family that worshiped and prayed. All right, Luke chapter one, verse eight through nine, it says, and it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. Okay, so what's he doing here? He was worshiping. He was faithful to worship. Now, the key word here is faithful, committed. Priorities, we all have them, don't we? Well, even, even, even the person that says, oh no, I just, I'm a free spirit. I just go through life and I'm free. I just do whatever, whatever I wanna do. That's a priority, <laughs> right there even. We all have priorities. If we were to take all of our priorities, all the things in life that are important to us, and make a list, prioritize it. What is the most important, okay? Where would worship fall on that list? In other words, what are the things that if they took place would come before worship? What are those things that we would put before it? Or maybe it's right on top. Everything else comes after it. I'll just tell you right now, it's not on the top of my list. There are some things that I think would be above that. Okay. For example, um, I'm sitting in my office Sunday morning and law enforcement stopped by and they tell me my wife's been in a serious accident on her way here and uh, she's been airlifted to St. Louis. I won't be here for church that morning, okay? But what are the things that keep you from worship? Priorities. This godly couple, worship was a priority. It was a top priority. And listen, even though they had problems, and I emphasize that because many times our priorities change when the problems come into our life, worship falls and we get distracted with the problems and that's the focus of our thoughts and our minds and we're not worshiping God anymore and we're not corporately worshiping with other believers. This couple, they were faithful even though they had problems. Now, let's read this next verse, but I want you to keep it handy in, in, your, in your mind here. James chapter 1 and verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. Okay? Now, another verse. Luke 1 verse 10. It says, And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. Okay. Zacharias prayed. Now, I would ask the men, how many men do we have in here this morning where you would call yourselves praying men? But I'm not going to. <laughs> Probably better to ask the ladies in our life. How many ladies have a praying man in their homes? Men, how many men have a praying woman in their home? <laughs> Young people, how many of you have praying parents? in your home. 
this couple, they prayed. Zacharias, it says here, he prayed before the Lord individually, but he's also leading people in prayer, public prayer. He's leading people in prayer publicly. He's leading people to pray, in fact. Because of his example, he's leading others to pray. He was leading them to be praying people. Now, the Bible says here it was just Zacharias doing this. So I'm just going to focus on that half of the couple equation. Men, we need to do this in our homes. We need to lead the way in being a praying home. It doesn't matter how we feel. I feel self-conscious. I don't feel like I have the right thing to say. It doesn't matter. We need to lead in this. This was a family that worshiped and prayed. Now, also, a family that was blessed. Look with me at verse 11. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense, incense and when Zacharias saw him he was troubled and fear fell on him but the angel said unto him fear not Zacharias for thy prayer is heard thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son and thou shalt call his name John this is amazing what's taking place here they're childless and they're too old to have children and now he's being told by an angel of the Lord it's going to happen verse 14 and thou shalt have joy and gladness and many shall rejoice at his birth, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall be turned to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord." Wow, there's a lot the angel's telling him there. Zacharias was righteous. He worshiped. He prayed. He led other people to pray. And God blessed. There's a key here that we need to recognize, admit. There is a key to unlock God's blessings. We don't necessarily get blessed just because we came to church today. <laughs> but God does promise blessings. And it's demonstrated for us here for these two parents. Look how they were blessed. Their need was met in a very personal way. And this happened while he was praying, by the way. While he was praying, the angel of the Lord came to him. Now, I'm not saying that while you guys are praying, you're going to start having visions, okay? God doesn't speak to us except through the Bible today. But it was while he was praying that the prayer was answered. While he was worshiping, doing what he was supposed to be doing, God answered. And their prayers were answered. Elizabeth was to be with child. And not only that... This is every parent's wish. Their son was to be great, okay? <clears throat> we all want our children to be great, don't we? What is greatness? I think I have great children, okay? If you asked me, do you, do you, you know, are your children great? I would say, yeah, yeah. What parent would say, <laughs> don't let's not even go there. <laughs> Well, there was a time in my life my dad would have said that about me, okay? Uh, he would have just said, pray for him, okay? <clears throat> but what makes a person great in order to earn that title? title is it um, if, they're, if they grow up to be well-known? Ah, they're great. Is it that they become financially successful? They can be great, um, or is it because they do great things? So great would be for those who are either well-known, have lots of money, or do great things, develop a cure for cancer, whatever. Well, let's look at the character traits that God lists 
for greatness in describing what their son is going to be like. First of all, it's his life would not shame them but bring joy. That's a character trait of a great child. People would rejoice because of his contribution to society. Whatever it is that this baby's going to do, there are people that are going to rejoice because of it. He's going to be a blessing to others. Because of his obedience, he would be great in God's eyes. It says there that he would live a disciplined life, abstaining from even the appearance of evil, and that he would be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's greatness in God's eyes. We, we sometimes, I think, have the wrong idea of what greatness is. We have to be careful as parents. We don't push our kids to have the right career, make the right money, and, and marry the right person or go to the right school. God doesn't consider any of that great. These five traits, God says, makes a person great. Can we, as parents, can we have, uh, even as individuals, can we have these traits and not be well-known? Yes. Can we have these traits and not be financially successful or do great things? God says, yes, you can. And God says, if you do them, even though you don't accomplish anything and you're not rich, you're great in my eyes. How does that happen? Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. How can we make that happen? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. That's where we get off the train. <laughs> we spend so much time trying to be like the world. How much can we be like them without being wrong? When we just focus on being transformed by the renewing of our mind so that we can prove, we can demonstrate what is the good and perfect, acceptable will of God. Here's a thought for us. We need to understand that God heard their prayers and blessed them for their faithfulness. All right, consider this verse, 1 John chapter 3, verse 22. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Now, as parents, we're all going to fail. As grandparents, we don't fail because grandparents are perfect. No, we do. <laughs> Only because we failed as parents and we're trying to do it right with the grandkids now. But as I mentioned before, um, Zechariah and Elizabeth, they weren't perfect. Here's how. Let's look at unbelief. Verse 18 and 19 of Luke chapter 1. Zechariah, he just had this message given to him from the angel. And he said unto the angel, whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife, he didn't call her old. He just said, well, stricken in years, okay? <laughs> and the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God and am sent to speak unto thee and to show these, these glad tidings. So he just heard the words of God through this angel, and he's doubting. <laughs> he's, got, he's just not believing it. It just doesn't. It doesn't make sense to him, okay? He couldn't believe the message and the promise of God. Yes, he was praying, but apparently as he's praying, he's not really believing that God would answer it because boom, he gets this answer and he's not believing it. The very word and promise of God should have been enough. Would you agree with me on that? Absolutely. But it wasn't. And it's not for us many times either. 
We have, we have way more promises from God than Zechariah did. We have the Bible, hundreds of promises in there. Where, like Matthew um, 6.33, seek first the kingdom of God, back to that priority thing, and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. All these things of life that when we're dead and gone won't matter. <laughs> All these things that become more priority than worshiping and God, they're not going to matter. God's promises, you seek these things and I'll take care of the rest. There's a promise. But when it comes time to actually making decisions on our priorities, do we believe that promise? And because of his unbelief, oh, God had to discipline him, to train him. Okay, to, to help him grow. Now, the word discipline, it's not a bad word, okay? Um, if we're thinking of it in a parental sense, our mind is probably going to say, oh yeah, whooping. Time for a whooping, <laughs> okay? Um, whatever form of parental punishment you apply for your children. It's not that kind of discipline. Although it's not pleasant, God designs it to help us to grow, to learn, which is what all parental discipline should be. Um, let's look at verse 20. Behold, here's what the angel said to him, because of his unbelief, thou shalt be dumb, not able to speak, until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. Because of his unbelief, God's going to have to discipline him and help him understand, no, you need to trust me. So he took away his ability to speak. All right. Now, let's look at verse 21. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. He wanted to speak. He couldn't. He would be unable to speak until John was born. Now, I want us to notice the uniqueness of the way God is disciplining Zacharias here. It was very unique to Zacharias. There are some people that really don't like to talk. There are some people that have to talk and wish they didn't have to talk all the time. Okay? And it was like, oh, nine months of not having to talk to anyone. That would be heaven. <laughs> Um, so maybe that wouldn't be so unique for some people, but it was very unique for Zacharias. He spoke unbelief to the angel. When the angel told him this is what's going to happen, he spoke his unbelief. So what did God do? God removed his ability to speak. He removed Zechariah's ability to share the word of God with others for nine months, something that he did prior to that. And now he can't do that anymore. God removed his ability to speak any more words of unbelief that someone else might hear. Oh, that's really interesting. Every person that is a true child of God will be trained or disciplined by God. His method of training, it's going to be different for each of us. It's going to be unique, perfectly suited for each of us. Those of you that, that have had children come and gone in your house, I bet you those that have children in your home already, you already know this. Um, each child's different. My, my son, um, he, he didn't, he, I don't know, he was just stubborn. That's what it was. And, and he just would not learn. Um, until, you know, blood was dripping on the floor. Then I'm just kidding about that, okay? Um, but my daughter, all daddy had to do was just look at her. And she would melt into this sobbing, wailing mess. I'm sorry, daddy, I'm sorry. My son wasn't like that, okay? And God knows exactly what it's going to take to get us to grow. And because, because I loved my son and my daughter, I did those things to help them grow. 
And I'm so thankful that because God loves me, he does those things in my life. Now, my son and my daughter, they didn't like those times, okay? And we don't like them when God's training us. But I'm sure glad he does. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 19. God says this, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. <laughs> Psalm 94, 12, blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law. God will not allow a man to disbelieve and distrust forever. See, the day is coming when God will stop all disbelief, all distrust, just as he did with Zacharias in that day. God says, one day, every knee is going to bow before him. The person that blatantly just believes there is no God, he's going to bow before God one day. God promises that. And then he'll believe. Now, notice with me in verse 23. It came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. Okay, let me explain what, what kind of being said there. Um, in, in, at, at this time, there was one temple. The priests were from the Levitical family, all the uncles and everything and extended families. If you were a, a, a Levi or in that from the tribe of Levi, you were a priest. There were about 20,000 of them, one temple. So they had assignments, okay? Each, each family unit had like one week twice a year. So that's the days of his ministration. We're over, okay? His week of service is up. Pastor Taylor, here's preachers that work two weeks a year. Wow. But when they're not in the temple, they're at home trying to raise their crops and survive and eat and all of that too. But here's the point. His week was accomplished and he went home. He still can't talk. He's at home. He's not in the city. He's not near the crowds. No one's looking at him. But even before that, okay, this, this event took place where he lost his ability to speak. And God's training him now because of his unbelief. What did he do right then? Okay, he woke up in the morning, and then by the end of the day, oh, this bad thing happened in his life. What does he do? He finishes serving God. He finished out the days of his ministration. He didn't quit and go home. He didn't sit home and lick his wounds. He was faithful. Remember, these were godly parents. And here's a characteristic being displayed for us. He stayed committed. He stayed faithful, even though he couldn't speak. He didn't just go home. He didn't stop serving because he had a difficulty in his life. Now, he wasn't preaching. He couldn't speak. So what he did was different but he didn't stop serving. He didn't stop worshiping. He, he kept doing what he could. What hope for all of us, folks? On so many different levels. First, those of us that, that are parents and your children are still at home. Please evaluate where you're at right now. What character traits you need to work on in your home? Those of us that are parents whose children aren't at home, grandparents, okay? We're still parents. We can't send them to their room, but we're still parents. We still need to be demonstrating these qualities. Individuals, whether we're parents or not, these are godly qualities. Take, 
parents out of the title, godly parents, just say godly people. <laughs> that needs to be us. This needs to be us. Whatever we've done, whatever we've been in the past, doesn't matter. Because from this day forward, if we could hit like a reset. Um, uh, last month, we showed the movie here, Courageous. And uh, towards the end of the movie, there's the, the father, he's out jogging with his son. And I remember it so clearly, he stopped running. And, and he basically said to his son, you know, I haven't been a good father, but I want to finish well. Decide today, I'm just going to finish well. Man, we've all made mistakes. Uh, the 50-year-old the range where I'm at right now, yes, the aches and pains are starting. Some of you all were right in your predictions. <laughs> but it's also in this age range where you're looking back at your hands-on parenting you did and see things, oh, man, why did I do that? Why didn't I do this? You know what those things do? They steal your joy. What's in the past is in the past. God says from this day forward, okay, here's the reset button. Make the decision now. Here's the way it's going to be. So there's hope for all of us. When when you look at what God has done in other people's lives, I'm a firm believer that God can change anyone. Absolutely. And God could take anyone that has made grievous errors and mistakes and wash him white as snow. Okay? But are we going to believe that enough to allow God to forgive us for mistakes we've made in the past and start moving forward, committed, faithful to him. It's just a choice that, that we each get to make today.